uh, uh, thank you for the data days conference to invite me. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, two of my recent work. One is already published and one is a working project and uh, look at how NIP can be, or natural language processing can be applied to financial markets. I think all of you must have heard about ChatGPT. So ChatGPT is uh, one of the, or small part of the whole NLP uh, research area. Uh, I'm machine learning PhD student in College of Computing. I also co-advised by Professor Sudhir Chava from College of Business. So uh, first pro project I have worked on is a trillion dollar words, which was published at ACL. So first, what is FOMC? So if you might be aware of FOMC or Federal Reserve Bank or Jerome Powell, uh, what, they, what is the function of FOMC? So what FOMC does it, it controls the money supply in the market uh, by increasing the interest rate or decreasing the interest rate by purchasing the US treasury or uh, offloading them from the balance sheet to control the money supply. Why they do it? They have two goals. One, they want to create a price stability like during the COVID we saw the high inflation. Now Fed is fighting the inflation at this point. Another goal is maximum employment. When the economy is doing well or even any situation the goal of the government or Fed is to create an economic situation or money supply in the market, which helps create a price stability, control inflation close to 2%, and achieve a maximum employment. So why NLP and FOMC? So if you are aware of that FOMC's words matters a lot, because if you look at the last year, the speech, Jerome Powell gave just eight minutes speech at, uh, speech at Jackson Hall, and it wiped out $3 trillion from the US equity market within those eight minutes. And over the course of the week, it wiped out almost $8 trillion from the US equity market. So what it tells us is that just one event or few words from Federal Reserve Chair can move the entire market. And not just, it doesn't affect just US equity market, but whole global economy. <laughs> also, this chart shows that in last 10 years, specifically, how much uh, interest rate changes or how much the money supply in the market. So if you look at here, the red line is a money supply in the mar market, how much it changed, and also the 12 month change in the uh, S&P 500 return. So if you look at last 10 years returns or last 12 years return now, most financial markets are driven by either monetary policy, which is set by FOMC or fiscal policy, which is from the US government. So what prior work has been done on this area? So there are many studies which have shown that Yes, Federal Reserve Bank's uh, words or statement affects the market. And also, uh, there is no one has done any work on using the transformer based model, which is a base also for the models like GPT. Recent work has been done on creating a data set on multi model. Multi model is where you combine audio, text, video on a press conference done by FOMC. Uh, but again, there is, they have used different kind of models in an unsupervised manner and not a supervised manner. Supervised manner learning is a when when you train on a labeled data set. The model becomes much better instead of just trying to learn from an unlabeled data set. So this is the, the what, what we have done is the first study, build a data set on FOMC and train a model or train a state of the art model on the data set. So we start with a dictionary from Yuri's uh, work in 2021. We have two set of words. First set of words are related to inflation. Uh, and second one is more towards growth and unemployment. Now we start by collecting data on three different class. So Federal Reserve Bank have their in, uh, meeting eight times in a year. Means they have eight meetings every 45 days. We collect the data from 1996 to 2022. We also collect press conference transcripts from 2011 onwards. Before that, Fed never used to have press conference after the meeting. Starting 2016, they started holding a press conference every meeting instead of alternate meeting. Speech, so Federal Reserve Chair, governors of regional bank, uh, Federal Reserves, they also give speeches at uh, various institutions or uh, various uh, banks. And they are also all recorded and they are part of the official records of Federal Reserve Bank. So we collect uh, 200 plus meeting minutes, uh, 60 plus press conference and speeches. The challenge here was that most of the speeches are not relevant because sometimes our student uh, chair goes to a university to give a speech about his life experiences. That doesn't affect the market because they will not talk about the markets or 
what will be their monetary policy stance. So what we do is the dictionary we showed uh, earlier in the slide. We use that dictionary to filter out the speeches which are relevant. And we also filter out the sentences from the transcript or meeting minutes which are relevant to us by using the same word based approach. Now, after collecting all the data set, uh, we randomly sample five sentences from each transcript across all years, and uh, that makes us uh, that makes a 3400 or 2300 sentence level data set, which we want to annotate manually. So, how do we label it? We created three labels for each sentence. It will be either labeled dovish, hawkish, or neutral. What is dovish? If economy is not doing well. Fed will say, okay, we need to support the economy by increasing the money supply in the market. And how Fed generally achieves it by cutting the interest rates or purchasing the US treasury from the market. Second is hawkish, when Federal Reserve Bank tried to decrease the money supply from the market, which it is currently doing by increasing the interest rate and uh, selling of the bonds on, from their balance sheet. <laughs> And neutral when Federal Reserve doesn't take a stance or they are talking about in general something else and they don't take a stance on uh, either side hawkish or dovish. After, so this is the annotation guide we used uh, after extensive discussion to make sure that all the annotation is done by two annotator are consistent. And in the annotation uh, process, we got 90% agreement between two annotators. Uh, we resolve all the annotation uh, disagreements by looking at the annotation guide, again, referring to the annotation guide or looking more de uh, deeper into the particular meeting or particular uh, monetary policy stance during that particular time period. These are individuals that are the annotators? Sorry, these are? So annotators. Those are individuals looking at the data sets. Of yes, the time yes assigning levels. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Again, when we, were, when we started doing annotation, we were... Earlier, we were just labeling one label per sentence because we thought, okay, either the sentence will fall into hawkish category or dovish category. But if you look at an example here, uh, if you example, first part of the sentence, the green part is dovish because Federal Reserve is talking about how economy is not, or they are downgrading the economic growth. So then they will increase the money supply, we will assume. But in the second part, they are talking about uh, the higher than expected potential output growth. So that will lead to a hawkish level. So how do we handle this kind of case? So then we develop a very simple methodology to split this kind of sentences where there is a keyword like but, although, and then break it down. And then uh, that increases our data set size by, so we found very few sentences, close to 40 or 50 sentences. We break them down and label those individual part uh, separately. Now, just to give a uh, overview of uh, the kind of models we are using is, you m might have heard about GPT, but not about the BERT. BERT was the base for models like GPT. Uh, we will not go in the technical detail, but the whole idea in general is, first you train a model to learn what is English or what is the English language semantics. How do you achieve that? You just give it a millions of or billions of sentences and you give it a very simple task to solve, which is uh, fill in the blank. You give a sentence, you mask or remove one particular word from the sentence and ask model to predict that particular word. And you keep, do, keep on doing that over iteration after iteration on billions of sentences and model learns the English language in general, but it doesn't have any capability of doing a particular task. So what you do is the second stage, we call it a fine tuning. The fine tuning job is suppose in this case, we want model to predict whether the label should be hawkish, dovish or neutral, right? So you train model further, to do any specific task. Uh, then we have recent models, which are GPT models, which doesn't require fine tuning. Why? The way the models are trained on. So instead of doing a fill in the blank task, in this case, the models are trained to predict the next word. Suppose in this case, if the input is a robot must, so you will, if the model will predict certain words, and you have again, billions of sentences, and then you for each, token, you can try to predict the next token or next word. And then again, you train on now, not just billion of billions of words, the GPT is trained on almost 2 trillion tokens or close to a trillion words. So you train the model again and again, uh, or iteratively to make it better to predict the next word. So now when you type a prompt, oh, can you help me write an email for something? 
Then it will predict the next word. It will be okay. It will start with word hello, comma. Then it will start I start predicting word I, then hope, something like that, right? So in that case, you can just give a model a sentence and ask it, okay, can you label this sentence something? I want three label, hawkish, dovish, or neutral. Can you label one of them? And it can directly predict. It's called in-context learning. Why? In which case, when you're asking the question, it can learn from the question itself. You don't need to further train or put resources to fine tune for a particular task. That's a big difference between bird kind of model, and GPT kind of model, or chat GPT, what you see. So we take the bird kind of model, which we have five different bird versions, as well as we also benchmark against chat GPT, and we have some simpler models. Uh, so we do very extensive work on running experiments on identifying which model performs the best. And it wasn't, it could not be possible without the support of OIT. I think James, uh, Robert, uh, Herbert Chang, and Robert Griffin from OIT. Because of them, it took us 45 days on two GPUs uh, to run all this experiment. It's uh, we have total eight, eight, ten different models, eight different combinations. Plus, we have 48 different configuration or hyperparameter configuration for each. Then what we identify is the fine-tuned model because how it performs when chat GPT, uh, when we just try to do it a prompt on chat GPT. <laughs> so we take now Roberta model as our best model for any further analysis. We, we also got question when we are developing this project. Okay, so say hawkish, is it negative? And dovish is positive because hawkish will have a negative impact on the market. So are you doing something new or because there are already models which can do a sentiment analysis or sentiment classification? So what we do is we benchmark the current state of the art sentiment analysis model Finbert, and we found that the accuracy is even below ChatGPT model or our any baseline. So it showcases that hawkish dovish is different than just a traditional sentiment analysis. <coughs> so now what we do with uh, all this annotation, we have trained the model. The model can predict if I give it a new sentence or whether it's a hawkish or dovish. Now I have labeled all of them. What do I do with it? So what we do is we create a measure of a particular document, I, by calculating number of hawkish sentence in the document, uh, number of dovish sentence, and number of neutral, and we create a measure of hawkishness. This is number of hawkish sentence minus dovish divided by V, Normalize it by the total number of sentences in a particular document, whether it be text conference transcript or meeting minute. After considering the measure, we first try to look at qualitatively how it co varies with the CPI and uh, PPI data. So, as you will see, it not only tracked the high inflation period, uh, like the recent inflation, but it also uh, correctly tracked the uh, deflationary period, like 2008 crisis, 2001. Uh, dot com bubble crisis. So what it shows us qualitatively that our measure or our model works at aggregate level in understanding the market or understanding the macroeconomy. To understand deeper and understand how the Fed speech, where is based on the who is the chair. So we divide our analysis into four chairs uh, in our sample period of analysis, starting from Greenspan to Powell. You will find a very, we found a very interesting result here that if you look at the correlation is much lower during the Greenspan era, but it becomes very close to one during the Powell era. And that's very evident if you listen to them. Greenspan used to say that if I am talking on monetary policy, and if you understood something, it means you do not understand anything. Because I'm just mumbling words. My job is to not give you any signal what we are trying to do. Versus Powell says clearly, we want you to be prepared. We don't want to give any shock in the market. Uh, we don't want to hide any information from you. So it's a communication style difference from chair to chair. Uh, and again, it's <laughs> difference, but I always prefer the transparency because that helps investors or retail investors to ensure investors is coming. We also look at how Created measure can help us uh, predict or understand the US Treasury market better. So we look at different maturity US bonds and we look at their correlation or the regression on the US Treasury yield. 
So what we see here is the US Treasury or uh, the long term maturity treasury, 10 year, three year, and uh, say three month and one year. So if you look at the longer the maturity, the impact is less. Monetary policy stances will affect uh, the current or short term treasury more than the long term treasury. Then at the end, we thought, okay, can we actually use it uh, for any trading strategy or is there any alpha to be made in the market? So we just build a very simple trading strategy by taking taking the triple Q index because triple Q index has shown one of the greatest performance over the last 10 12 years. Just the roll return of triple Q is close to 500%. So we take triple Q uh, index or triple Q fund and we create just a long short, very simple trading strategy because it doesn't involve any additional cost. Of trading or anything, we take it, and if the measure is hawkish, uh, after any meeting, we short the triple Q and we go long. If it is bullish, if you look at the chart, it might seem that there is not too much difference, <laughs> but if you quantify it, it's uh, almost 160% additional return over triple Q uh, over just 10 years. Accounting for transaction costs and other things like that too. Or Yes, but transaction costs are very low because we are only trading every 45 days. We are not trading at every minute or like a uh, binary decision. Uh, yes, yeah. yes. So our frequency is it's a very low frequency right. trade. We are adjusting portfolio. Later, one can enhance the same methodology by making a combination of, of uh, triple Q with bonds. Because the time when you are shorting triple Q, you can go long on the mm -hmm. bond because at that time bond will provide higher yield. So to conclude, in our this work, we have created the largest list and label data set on FOMC, and we have created the best model for which can classify sentences or monetary policy stance into hawkish versus dovish. And our market analysis shows that it can uh, track CPI, PPI data. It can also track US Treasury. And also a simple event, simple training strategy, like just long short triple Q, can yield some uh, additional promising returns. Any questions so far on? Uh, Are you rich? <laughs> <laughs> Are you rich now? <laughs> At least uh, I will say this way: that income tax department doesn't know if I'm rich. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you 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 were able to predict. I mean, you more understood the market. Is it useful to predict? Sure. Yes. Yeah, so that's what the trading strategy so shows. Yeah, but. Like it was what you showed. It was uh, over eleven years. Eleven. I think twenty eleven. You predicted events that were like twenty days into the future. Like yeah. 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 It's a forty-five day into the future because we don't adjust the next forty-five days. It's it's how you would implement the implementation of this model would be a chair and then. Whatever the most recent estimate is before at your 45 day increment. Yes. So means I use it for my portfolio as a, one of the signal. I don't use it uh, directly as a just one uh, strategy. It's one of the signals on the uh, one of the X variables. And because my portfolio is more crypto heavy than uh, traditional assets, so but definitely FOMC affects crypto market even more than the traditional market because it's all about the whole idea of crypto is against somewhat against the dollar. So then dollar value is highly uh, depend on the how the monetary policy is because the increasing supply in the money will decrease the value of the dollar and that also increase the value or belief in uh, entire crypto system. So given that my portfolio is highly crypto heavy, it helps me a lot, but I don't trade triple Q directly. So um, I was wondering like, when you, you mentioned that you split the um, like speeches and all the you know sentences by sentences and classify them, but uh, how do you deal with the issue in context? And like you just take a sentence by itself and get it right chat GBT or you need to put Is it just that like in feel that doesn't really matter or you guys have a workflow? 
So, so most in most cases the self has enough context to uh, label either hawkish or dogish. So generally what happens, generally the meetings are more skewed. Uh, most particular meeting or something will be either hawkish or dogish. There's two times where it's just completely neutral, like some of people like that was last two or three years. Measure shows almost close to zero value. And that's why we have a neutral label. Those are uh, scenarios. How do you get access to the transcript? Or... How do you get access to the meetings? Or... So from federal, it's just public. No, from federal reserve banks, uh, you can directly, from their website, you can track. And when they even do live, live meeting, you, they provide you API access, so you can scrape it out. Actually, one interesting was when we are collecting the data from their server, we actually identified in one of the mistakes in one of the it was a wrong time, and we emailed them and they corrected the database. So another, one of the good <laughs> thing came out of the project was we helped them correct one of the speeches. So the records are now tight. <laughs> if all the speeches by the members, is there a wait for whether they're currently a voting member or just a uh, activity member like a, uh, or discussion? And you have to look at the kind of change. So if it's positive or negative, does it uh, give any weight to whether it is the same as previous or they have now gone from being, it's not just being, uh, it's gone from being, um, can you be hawkish or it's actually switched? So, yeah, yeah. So I think we uh, did not do that analysis in this paper. We are writing a follow up paper where we look at even try to predict the mix in that. But there we actually, so we just take now our hawkishness measure, but not take it as a row measure for this particular meeting. We take a, in a way derivative from the last meeting. So what is the difference? Because what we care is not the current monetary policy stance. What can give you more information is what is a change from the previous meeting. I think your point is uh, uh, like very valid in terms of we are now looking at those even, you can look at what is the over year over year change in the hawkishness of the Federal Reserve Bank. So if you go back to your your chart where you were, uh, yes, that, mm -hmm. that it they follow relatively closely all the way up until twenty twenty one. Yes, where they go all over the place. Yes. What What do you feel like happened, like so, at that point in the graph? Because it's pretty not, dramatic. Yeah, it's yes, very dramatic because again, uh, this period is the highest inflationary period in the whole sample because we don't even have data going back till nineteen eighty. We have 1996, and uh, inflation was never above 8% uh, starting that period. So first thing, there was highest inflation period. And here, we will say market was wrong in a way, because market was not ex uh, accepting that Fed is going to increase the interest rate, what they were saying. So what our hypothesis, or what I will argue, is that market was delusioned at this point, assuming that Fed is not going to increase interest rate and tighten the monetary policy supply, even though they were clearly saying it. And... Uh, the market was keep going up. And another reason was the market was keep going up was not just that they were not believing in what Fed was saying. There was a lot of retail money powering in the market because of the high inflation. Unemployment rate is still below 4%, <laughs> historically low. There is a lot of saving money which was keep going in these index funds irrespective of what the uh, market or economy is doing. And because of that, the mar it took market time to correct it. So that's where even we earlier we had just an alpha of just 15-20% uh, for most of the period. But when we make more money and even more, most hedge funds make more money when there is a high volatility. Because after, if you look at this time period, after 2008 crisis, after 2012, this is the this was the first crisis, our first big market volatility period. So. So moving forward, so based on this project, when we look at the performance of chat GPT versus our model, the natural question came and then chat GPT became very popular. Even the question was, okay, whatever we are doing in terms of creating the data set, labeling them, which took, uh, took hundreds of hours, is it worth it? Uh, is it better to fine tune a language model or is it better to just use chat GPT for all these kind of tasks? So when we, we showed in our analysis and there is a, uh, Few papers came after that just in 2023 this year. But there is also one very interesting survey paper which is done for general domain, which takes almost uh, 150 tasks and shows that ChatGPT does well compared to fine-tuned models. 
only on 22% task. So it's not uh, a closed question that, okay, now we don't need to worry about building all these models. We can just use state GPT for anything. So we, we were curious that, okay, can we use it for financial domain task when we do sentiment analysis or any other task? So can we start using chat GPT or what are the drawbacks or what are the advantages and disadvantages of chat GPT versus specialized models, the ones we developed in the previous work? So we ask three questions that, again, what I mentioned that should we annotate the data set, spend all those human labor and train a specialized model or should we just use a from the chat GPT and get the answer? Again, with chat GPT, there are a lot of concerns because it's a closed model. What OpenAI has trained on is they have trained all, already on the test data set. So can we evaluate it fairly or not? There are a lot of questions there. So how it performs against the open source language models or open source version of the chat GPT, which is one is released by suppose Meta Llama. So what is the performance gap between closed models like chat GPT versus the open source counterpart? We also look at, okay, is it feasible to employ those these LLMs into financial market? Because uh, the latency for chat GPT is pretty high if, if you want to do a high frequency trading. I will show you some of the results uh, on the dimension as well. So in this work, we take four tasks. Uh, first, the, from the previous work itself, Hawkins Dovis classification. We have sentiment analysis. Then we have claim detection uh, on the analysis reports. In the analysis reports, analysts try to make particular claims and we want to extend those claims. And then there is a name entity recognition. The task name entity recognition's job is to identify name entities like person, location, organization, from financial news or any financial documents. So we take uh, two sets of model. One, again, I mentioned earlier, similar to ones which are, you take the model and then you fine tune them further. And another set of models are open and closed models. Closed models, we take Google's palm and chat uh, and open source model, there are four models which are available. So as mentioned earlier, we look at these four different tasks, which are in a way, uh, which covers somewhat representation of the financial domain task, but is not uh, so far full complete analysis. We are working on adding more tasks so that we can have a more comprehensive analysis on chat GPT versus other models. So this table has all the results to answer those three questions in a way. So if you look at here again, GPT and specifically GPT-4 comes very close to the performance uh, of the robot, a large model uh, we trained in the previous work. But if you look at close source, a open source model like Falcon, Dolly, and H2O are far behind uh, GPT. So there is a still a lot of work open source model needs to do in order to come close to GPT. And with GPT, the problem is as soon as you release the data set, uh, they will train their model on that. So we, you know, through our work, we release our data set as an open source data set. So even the moment before we release our data set to after we have seen increase in the performance of ChatGPT, we don't know from where it is coming. They might have just in, improved their foundational model or they might have trained on our data set. Uh, because it has shown in some study that ChatGPT performs lower on the similar task if it is data set is publicly available or not. The second, the third question, which is more important, most important to finance domain is the latency. So if you look at, if you have a fine-tuned model, which is specialized, which can only do one particular task, which cannot be used for any other, you can make it run in within a millisecond. So if suppose news came or sentiment analysis, or in the FOMC case, if Federal Reserve Bank's meeting minutes came, you can do it much faster in millisecond compared to chat GPT if you use, it will take almost a second. So it will take thousand times more time and in markets it's all about who is placing the order first so it's not even feasible even the model can perform as well as uh, the specialized models because the way they scale the model so the robot model is just 300 million parameter versus chat gpt has almost 200 billion parameters so it's a thousand times larger model so there is a larger latency and one cannot avoid the latency because it has to go through the whole pipeline So these are the answers we found so far from those four tasks that, okay, zero is not hero yet. We can't just use chat GPT with a zero short prompt. Uh, closed source model are still ahead compared to open source LLM. And I think in a few months, we might have better models which can outperform or come close to chat GPT performance. 
and again the in finance domain so far i don't see it being feasible in actually building algorithmic trading or quant trading strategies i'm seeing that you're using the f1 score i assume it's because the data set is not uh, balanced yes yeah it's more towards which policy so in our uh, uh, fomc task all the there is a good class balance so we have around 35-40% hockey is 35-40% dovish and 20-25% uh, neutral sentences. But because we have much less neutral sentences, we wanted to calculate F1 score, not accuracy. Because F1 score can uh, accommodate for the class imbalance. Any further questions? Or anyone have any question from online? If About doing other texts, uh, including other texts besides like the official meeting meeting and things like that, like financial articles or whatever. Do you get <laughs> the feel for uh, what the population of the you showed the gap. I mean, that's you know. I, I think that's a we are working with the second project. Also, we are incorporating financial news articles. But we are only collecting for uh, FOMC project. We are only data from Fed, you have meeting minutes, press conference and speeches, that all combination coming from the Fed, but how the market is perceiving the information. So that's the second or counterpart of it, right? Because market will react to how the market or analysts are perceiving that information. So what we are looking at is we are looking at Wall Street Journal article published on the meeting date, starting from the meeting end till the evening. And even what we are seeing is they change their tone over time. Because when it comes, the meeting ends at 2.30, they want to write some article and provide some quick insights on what happened in the meeting. But by the evening, they digest the information better or more, and then they react to it. And then the next article is more matured in the evening, which represent how the market will actually react. People, it's difficult to get talk track. It's natural, it's randomness. Yes. Clickbait. Yes. <laughs> well, even now, uh, we were actually collecting data from Twitter before Twitter went to Musk uh, because earlier they were providing free academic access where we can collect the tweets on the particular topic. So even we, we were planning to look at how on social media people are reacting to Fed's meeting because there people talk a lot just before the meeting, after the meeting, their interpretation of the meeting or their interpretation of the news. So it becomes... First meeting happens, then news comes in, and then how people are discussing on social media. But sadly, now we can't do much more on social media aspect because earlier only Twitter was the one who was providing free API access. Now they have closed. Uh, are you looking at all feedback in those situations? Or were you only looking at certain sources? I call it more. So what we did, we first identify the accounts which tweet with hashtag FOMC or hashtag uh, Jerome Powell or something, and we identify those tweets from one day before the meeting and one day after meeting, those four-day window. Two, the meeting is two-day long, so we capture those four-day window and collect all the tweets which has certain attention. But from any, anywhere, anyone, or on, no, the, on the experts? We, no, the problem with Twitter is even earlier, they don't have location information through API. And Twitter, you can set your location anything. It doesn't, the lo location is not determined based on your GPS location. You can set up anything. You can right now even write it moon and you can set it as your location. So Twitter allows that. So we can't do it. And we don't even have IP address from where the tweet was done. So it's uh, impossible to know exact location. I think. I heard of some research where they did uh, geolocation, like geolocation based on. Yes, yes, yes. So I mean, that's a, one can use a proxies for the same. There are future applications um, you see from the main is that, and you said you're working on this. <coughs> what kind of application is this? Uh, of the model we have trained. You know the work you're currently doing. Oh, so the work we are currently doing, so right now we are focusing on expanding the first the analysis of FMC, but my biggest project right now is focused on building finance domain um, language model, where we are taking the existing Llama, which is the currently best open source language model, 
and trying to build a financial domain version of it. So that even if you are doing all those uh, prompting, can we out or can we build a language model specific to the finance domain, which can help with all those financial tasks and can it outperform models like ChatGPT? So Bloomberg paper cited my paper as well, but uh, I have a lot of critical feedback against that paper. So there is an opportunity there. <laughs> The way they have done some of the things, I don't agree. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to still in the research phase. If you have an actual line into the real world, so Ms. Georgia Tech Foundation reached out to us, uh, which manages the Georgia Tech uh, endowment, and they are we are in discussion with them. They plan to use it as we generate every meeting uh, in their own portfolio. The measure you said the data set is open source, but the measures that you guys generate is that also open source or is that like uh... we release that with delay in a way? Yeah, because people can use model, but model is open source. So they, if they want to build their own, they can do it. Because for academic publishing, we have to uh, make it open source. The information that you were showing that one was against the okay, NPI. Okay, and then have you looked at any other markets or? Texas and see how it trends to those other ones, be it anything from gold prices to you obviously are doing crypto, but yeah, we haven't looked at the gold prices. We are looking right now more on the VIX because if you can predict the volatility, you can do the option trades. So we are looking at uh, VIX and volatility and those measures instead of looking at more macro measures. 